Ships have things that just make them ships. Funnels and towering smokestacks, tall masts, cluttered ventilators, wooden decks, and then the ever-present porthole. The imagery is iconic. When lit at night, they look like stars draped across the night sky. What about the image of portholes dipping below the waterline in James Cameron's Titanic? Certainly one of the most famous and ominous shots in the film. It might be easy to overlook portholes and take them for granted, much like we might do windows on our houses. But portholes play much more than just an aesthetic role on any ship. From providing critical light and air to aiding in escapes during emergency scenarios, portholes are clever bits of kit that are still made for ships across the world, even though their history goes back hundreds of years. Today, let's take a look at, and not through, portholes. How they work, where they came from, and how they were used on the world's most famous liners. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm your friend Mike Brady from Ocean Liner Designs, and this is the story of the humble but mighty porthole. Portholes haven't quite been around as long as ships and boats have, because after all, back in history, it would have taken quite some time for them to be big enough to even need portholes in the first place. But their history still dates back hundreds of years. Early shipbuilders faced a problem. They needed, in some cases, to put holes in the sides of their ships. The only problem is that holes in ships have historically proven, well, problematic. So how could you make a hole in a ship that's also watertight? Portholes, also sometimes called side scuttles, and side lights in some cases, did not get their name because they were on the port side of the ship. So while there are portholes, there's no such thing as starboard holes. They actually got their name from the French word for door, porte, which gives us a clue as to the role early versions of portholes originally played. It's thought that the precursor to portholes first appeared in shipbuilding between the 15th and 16th centuries. Simply put, as guns got bigger and heavier, mounting them to the deck high up above the waterline was a dangerous proposition. They could impact the stability or top heaviness of the vessel, and it made for a crowded weather deck or forecastle deck during combat. Instead, shipwrights around the 16th century began to fit small doors on the hulls of their ships so guns could poke through during battle and then be covered over when they weren't in use. King Henry VIII, an avid supporter of the navy and England's naval power at large, wanted to equip his warships with guns so large that they could not be easily stored on deck of the forecastle or the aftercastle. Henry's flagship and pride and joy was the Mary Rose, a heavily armed Carrack sailing ship of about 500 tons and fielding around 80 or 90 guns, making her a true super weapon of the time. The secret to her immense firepower were the gun ports. When the weather was bad or the guns weren't required, the holes in the ship could be closed with a door. The system was clearly not a perfect one though. Mary Rose was caught in a strong gust that heeled her over and brought her overburdened and top heavy hull hard onto its side, allowing water to roar through the open ports and sink the ship. As naval architects refined their plans for ships equipped with gun ports through the 17th and 18th centuries, ships became generally more stable and less likely to be sunk because of their open ports. But even so, crews knew to shut their gun ports in big seas even as late as the 19th century, when large waves meant smaller ships of the line couldn't open their doors for combat for risk of flooding, even in the presence of the enemy. Now aside from providing convenient aiming points for guns, these gun ports also came with a probably unintended huge benefit. Fresh air. Ships holds in the days of wood hulled sailing ships were dark, dank places crawling with rats. Without running water or flushing toilets, ships simply stank as their crews, sometimes numbering into the hundreds, slept crammed into hammocks and ate below decks. The introduction of opening gun ports meant that crews on the gun deck could swing the doors open if the weather was right and let glorious fresh air and light in. It was a huge boost to morale and even health. But gun ports are a far cry from the round portholes we know today, and exactly where these came from is a little bit of a mystery. Window portholes became widespread on ships in the 1800s, only relatively recently when you think about it, because the technology required to mass produce them only became widespread in the early 19th century. Portholes, both then and now, consisted of a few pretty basic parts. They're usually constructed of a big circular frame or shell, made of bronze or brass, very heavy duty with holes cut in so they can be bolted or riveted directly to the ship's side. The most simple kinds of porthole, those only needed to let light in, 
simply had thick glass cut into a circle and mounted inside the frame, held in place with big brass screws, and then the entire assembly, which could weigh as much as 40 kilograms, it's around 100 pounds, was aligned with a hole cut into the hull, and then secured in place with the rivets or the bolts. But some portholes were designed to open. These featured a separate pivoting frame with the glass in that could be tightly shut against the rest of the porthole's frame with thick screws called dogs. At the top or the bottom of the frame, a huge hinge could swing the porthole open or shut as the user needed. But these changed the game because they let in light and fresh air. But from this very simple arrangement, a dazzling array of porthole types were designed and put into practice, including those that pivoted open sideways to funnel fresh air in at high speeds, we'll talk about those later, to those that stayed shut but used clever float-based systems to allow fresh air in, even in rough seas. Many lower down in ship's hulls featured deadlights, big circular covers that lowered down over the glass and locked in place. That way, if the glass, thick as it was, shattered in a storm, then the porthole remained watertight. Now, in the early days of implementing portholes, ships were designed so that they were arranged where they were needed the most, usually below decks, where fresh air and light were absolutely paramount. Now, this is notably the case with vessels like the Great Britain from 1845, when passenger comfort and health was given some serious technological consideration. But as time went on, ship owners knew that outside cabins with a porthole could be sold at a premium, versus the inside cabins, which had no natural air and light, not dissimilar to today's world where cruise ships charge a premium for balcony cabins. Inside cabins were, and still are today, the cheapest you could get. But finally, shipbuilders had a way to get beautiful daylight streaming into spaces in ships that would normally be shrouded in darkness. Portholes became ubiquitous and their shape is instantly recognisable, but it's important to note that portholes aren't round just to keep with tradition or pay homage. That iconic shape has real technical and scientific advantages. A ship on the water, a submarine underneath it, an aircraft at cruising altitude or even a space station floating high in outer space are all subjected to extreme pressure in one way or another. Fortunately, round objects like portholes are very good at dispersing that pressure evenly. A conventional window shape, like a square or a rectangle, would have stress concentrated on its corners if it was put under any serious pressure. Now a circular window, or a porthole, is able to disperse the pressure evenly without giving any one area a chance for the pressure to concentrate and cause a failure. Not only that, but by making the glass extremely thick, Portholes are very heavily reinforced, despite the fact their main component is made of a typically fragile material, glass. To that end, porthole glass can be a few inches thick. This natural strength is why you see portholes being used on all kinds of vessels, not just ships. Submarines, for example, use them as well. Famously, Alvin, the man submersible that took Dr. Robert Ballard and his team to the wreck of Titanic, has a few portholes to allow eyes on viewing, despite being almost two and a half miles or four kilometers below the surface. When extreme conditions call for it, the glass, called the port light in portholes, can be replaced with a high-tech and pressure-resistant material like acrylic or even quartz. Alvin's portholes are made from acrylic plexiglass, and similar portholes on the Russian Mir submersibles are 20 centimeters or 8 inches wide, but 18 centimeters or 7 inches thick. Aircraft use round windows for the same reason, even though some earlier aircraft used rectangular windows with rounded corners. Aboard the International Space Station, you'll find portholes too. The Coppola, a module made for observing the Earth, monitoring spacewalks, and checking on space shuttle arrivals and departures, has seven portholes made from fused silica and borosilicate glass. This high-tech material allows observers to see through it while being protected from solar radiation and the extreme temperature changes that frequently occur in outer space. It's amazing to think that what had begun as a way to get guns poking out the side of a galleon in the 15th century resulted in windows floating in space. Now back at sea, portholes could provide not just fresh air and light, they could also provide a means of escape in a pinch, even if this was really just an afterthought. Now tragically, some were simply made too small for a reasonably sized human to squeeze through. In fact, the smallest used aboard Titanic, for example, were just 9 inches or 22 centimeters wide. Now there are all kinds of horror stories of people being stuck during ship sinkings that are way too horrible for me to really mention here. So instead I'll give you a nicer anecdote. When the cruise ship Laconia caught on fire in 1963, passengers were able to squeeze through their portholes and they were lifted to safety by brave crew members dangling over the side from ropes. Laconia had been designed originally as the Dutch liner Johan van Oldenbarneveldt, serving the long distance route to the Dutch East Indies. 
and to cope with the heat, her portholes were very generously proportioned. A design choice that saved more than a handful of lives the night she caught alive. But just as on the Mary Rose, portholes presented clear and present danger to ships if they weren't carefully operated. The most obvious example, flooding in big seas, is a given, but a less obvious danger is cigarettes. Discarded butts from above had a habit of being sucked inside by open and unattended portholes, resulting in sudden fires that could doom a big liner. Passengers were forbidden, and they still are forbidden, to flick their cigarettes overboard for this exact reason. At night, stewards were tasked with shutting passenger portholes for the evening, and if big storms loomed ahead, the crew busily fitted deadlights and covers to any big exposed windows and sidelights across the ship. In Titanic's day, the Board of Trade mandated that portholes too close to the waterline either couldn't open at all, or that they could only be opened in port. The reason for this is very clear. When Britannic, serving as a hospital ship in 1916, struck a mine and began to sink, rows and rows of portholes left open to ventilate the wards suddenly met the ocean and sped the sinking up enormously. The portholes mainly presented passengers with sweet, sweet relief. Ships tasked with far-ranging voyages to Australia, Asia or the Mediterranean often provided staterooms and public rooms with scoops that could be fitted to the porthole and funnel fresh air into the room. Titanic and her sisters featured big, clever, utterly pivoting sidelights that did just this all by their own because they swung open by pivoting on a central axis and the porthole's glass and frame itself scooped fresh air in by virtue of being angled outside of the hull. But portholes didn't just exist on the hulls of ships. Take Titanic for example again. On a forward A deck, there were 14 interior cabins which did not have portholes. Now, having no access to fresh air and natural light in a first class stateroom would not have been an easy sell for the White Star Line. So, Titanic's builders, Harland and Wolf, came up with a clever solution. They installed portholes called skid lights at the level of the boat deck above. Now, from the outside, skid lights looked like traditional hinged portholes, but the magic in these skid lights happened on the other side. As Titanic moved along, light and air were directed via a shaft behind the skid lights down into the A-deck stateroom ceilings. A prismatic glass was fitted to better disperse light, and the system was concealed in the officers' quarters above. So while the White Star Line could not entirely replicate the feeling of having an actual cabin porthole, they were able to elevate the onboard experience of passengers in those cabins. Now as the age of ships like Titanic passed, and passenger ships like cruise ships got larger, and larger, the actual use of portholes and their location completely changed. For example, Titanic had two decks as part of her superstructure, whereas the Oasis of the Seas today has 16 above the hull alone. The Oasis of the Seas does have some portholes of course, but the simple matter of fact is that most passengers now live above the hull instead of inside it. These huge superstructures allow for modern day cruise ships to include more cabins that feature open balconies. Balcony cabins can be sold at a premium, much like outboard cabins with portholes once did. Passenger shipbuilding today is down to a simple equation. Simply put, designers are tasked with the challenge of fitting as many balcony cabins as possible on an ocean-going hull. Despite how far shipbuilding has come, and how much the purpose of ships has changed, passengers are still looking for the same thing they always have. Fresh air and sunshine. From cannons sporting doors to a breath of relief for cramped sailors, to outer space and everything in between, portholes have been serving their role and serving it well for hundreds of years. They're relatively small in comparison to other parts of the ship, but they've provided a large contribution to life at sea. I'll end on a fun little porthole themed anecdote by a Reddit user called Tupperwolf that's been bouncing around my brain for about 10 years. The story goes that he, an officer, was sat eating in the wardroom of a US Navy warship when a real grump of an operations officer marched in and plonked himself down to eat breakfast. The problem was that sunlight was streaming in through a porthole right into the guy's eyes. So he picked up a phone, muttered a few orders, and slowly the sun began to move off his face. He'd ordered a slight course shift, and to quote Tupper Wolf, he had literally redirected thousands of tons of steel and hundreds of people so that he could get the sun out of his eyes while he eats his bagel. For all their benefits, it would still seem that portholes just aren't for everyone. Ladies and gentlemen, it's your friend Mike Brady from Oceanliner Designs. Thank you so much for watching this video. If you enjoyed it, please leave a comment below. And don't forget to subscribe to the channel because we get new videos out weekly. If you want to support my work and get really cool perks like behind the scenes and early access, please visit my Patreon in the link in the description below or sign up as a YouTube member. Come and join the crew. And as always, stay safe, stay happy, and I'll see you again next time.